thank you for joining the Education Writers Association for this webinar on tracking state policies around children's well-being. I'm Lori Crouch, EWA's Assistant Director. Our uh, hashtag for this webinar is EWA webinar. So please use it if you want to tweet um, during the event. With that, I'm happy to turn this over to Melissa Taboda, um, our moderator for today. Thank you, Lori. Welcome, everyone. Um, again, my name's Melissa Taboda. I'm an Austin based journalist, and I am here with Deborah Temkin, who is the Vice President for Youth Development and Education Research at Child Trends. Uh, Dr. Temkin oversees the work of over 40 researchers investigating policies, programs, and practices that support the healthy development of youth. And her research agenda um, focuses on the intersections between education policy and healthy social and emotional development. So Deborah, we're gonna just turn it over to you so you can go over um, the findings of your research. Great, thank you so much. Um, and hopefully, Can I get a thumbs up from you, Melissa, if you can see my screen? I can see your screen. Perfect. Well, thank you everyone. I am here to talk about a really exciting resource that I hope that you can use in the course of your reporting. Specifically, uh, the National Association of State Boards of Education's State Policy Database on School Health. And just to give you a little bit of a background on uh, what this particular database is, um, it was originally launched in 1998 with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we were lucky enough to partner with the National Association of State Boards of Education um, in 2019 to relaunch a really revised version of this. Um, and we are just about to launch, um, this webinar is a preview of a newly updated web, uh, database that will include state statutes, regulations, and non-codified policies. And what we mean by that are things like board documents, board recommendation, toolkits, guidance documents, et cetera, from state departments of education um, as of September, 2019. And you can see the website on your uh, screen there, statepolicies.nasb.org slash health. Now let's talk about a little bit about what you'll find on this database. So we have based our uh, analysis and our inclusion of policies based on the whole school, whole community, whole child framework, or the WSCC. This is a framework that was developed by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and ASCD uh, to uh, capture all of the conditions for learning that need to be there to make sure that students are healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. Um, and really, we're talking about 10 different elements that we envision as school health. So when we talk about school health, we're not just thinking talking about things like health education and physical education, which are of course included, we're also talking about things like school safety, school discipline, school climate, employee wellness, all of these things which we know are so important today, especially given uh, the realities around COVID. So just to give you an idea, we have coded over 200 different topics aligned to these elements. Some of these topics include school discipline, suicide prevention, social emotional learning, mental health and trauma, nutrition, physical environment, so things like air quality, which we know is really important right now, employee wellness, vaccinations, vaping, school and community partnerships, school nurse availability, bullying and, excuse me, bullying and teen dating violence, um, as well as comprehensive and abstinence only health education. And these are just a handful of those 200 topics. Next week, when we fully launch the database, um, we will also be releasing a brief to go through some of the changes that we saw between the 2017 coding and 2019 coding. And you can see here on your screen, the percentage of healthy topics that are addressed in each state. And you can see the variation across the country. You can see, for instance, in South Dakota, where only 22% of the 200 topics that we looked at uh, were covered versus states like Florida, where 77% of uh, topics are covered. Just to give you an idea of the things that saw the most activity between 2017 and 2019, um, professional development for trauma topped that list. We saw 23 states add professional development for trauma policies compared to some of the other policies, which we really didn't see much movement on, such as nutrition. Um, mostly we saw a lot of uh, churn in terms of 
topics that related to school safety and mental health, which is not terribly surprising given the focus between 2017 and 2019 on school safety in light of uh, school shootings, for instance, at Parkland. Now, let me walk you through the database a little bit more closely. This is a screenshot of the new to be launched site, um, and I'm going to walk you through the elements. So, there are multiple ways to navigate this website. The first, uh, which we will look at a little bit more closely in, in live, in vivo, uh, is this Tableau database where you can click through and get an automatically generated map of how each state covers each of the 200 topics we cover. The other way to navigate this is through these menus at the top of your screen, uh, policies by state or policies by category. We're going to walk through the policies by category uh, just so you can get an idea of what type of content is included in the state policy database. So if we click policies by category, we will see those 10 domains of the WSCC. Under each domain are a list of topics related to that domain. So here I have expanded the counseling, psychological, and social services domain, and we see the topics that are covered there. We are going to click on the suicide prevention policy link. That takes us to a page that looks like this. Here we have a nice summary of which states have policies. So here we see 43 uh, states have some form of policy on suicide prevention um, and 10 states that do not. When we expand those lists, and this is a little blurry, so I apologize, we can actually see how each state covers each of the, that topic. And we can click on each state to bring us to the actual text of statutes, regulations, and non-codified policies that relate to suicide prevention. So here we see for Colorado, uh, they have a statute that includes a suicide prevention policy encouragement, as well as a risk assessment toolkit that was put out uh, by the Department of Education. And now we're going to switch over to looking at the live site. So you can see how to use this uh, database. So this is our Tableau visualization, and we are going to show you exactly how to go to uh, that suicide prevention policy. So here in category, we're going to select counseling, psychological, and social services. It will take a minute to load. Of course, it's being slow when it actually needs to work. There we go. Um, and then under sub topic, we are going to choose suicide prevention policy. This will generate a map, uh, which looks like this. And here you can see a coded version of the map that tells us which, poli which states have required policies, encouraged policies, only have non-codified policies, or do not address suicide prevention at all. Um, when we hover over each state, it will tell us which coding each state is. And when we click on the state, which I'm not going to demonstrate because it is not fully live yet, um, it will take us back to that page we saw before of the actual statute and regulations that are in each of those states. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it back to Melissa uh, to uh, facilitate some discussion about this database. Thank you so much. Um, well, I heard some really interesting um, points in your presentation and you know I kind of wanted to talk about like possible stories um, regarding student mental health it sounded like changes to school safety and security and student mental health um, saw the most changes in state policies and so you know possible stories that reporters could examine or you know how those changes and maybe specifically suicide prevention policy for example would you know are supporting students right now on the ground you know amid covid so as well as when students do come back to school um, a lot of times you do hear about um, states creating these policies as unfunded mandates so they created the policies but they don't put the money behind that so that's another angle to be examining is you know how much of um, you know these policies were given state funding so that these school districts could enact those policies on the ground um, so uh, uh, regarding that same thing, you know, for student mental health, you know, just looking at whether school districts used that state policy to put in more robust services 
uh, in their on their campuses and what that looks like right now. So are students receiving any kind of Zoom counseling, for example, if they are um, you know, not yet in person or if they are in person, are these um, you know, counselors or do they, you know, have they staffed the counselors to be able to provide the work to fulfill those policies? Um, and then, you know, I, one of the conversations that has really come to the forefront has been on school nurses and the shortage of school nurses amid COVID and just maybe also examining that, like, um, what um, policy changes have been put in place that might support having school nurses? And if none, you know, is that something that states are going to be willing to do this next go around, uh, particularly amid these national um, state shortfalls uh, in their budgets? Uh, and then, you know, one of the other um, things um, that I noticed in your uh, your data was that um, it sounds like there's about 12 states now that are putting in uh, policies uh, to train educators in cultural competency. And so I think another story that reporters can kind of latch on to are like how districts are covering that out once those states have those policies in place, uh, particularly amid the push for more racial equity. Any feedback on those, Deborah? Well, I would say um, I think those are all excellent uh, story ideas and a couple of things that you can do with the database to help facilitate that. So in terms of cultural competency, we can look that, yes, um, between 2017 and 2019, 12 states did add those policies. Um, we can actually go even deeper because the, the um, database allows you to actually look at the content of each of those states' policies. You can look at what are the common features, how many of them actually call out, for instance, specifically implicit bias versus just using the term cultural competency. And I think that helps frame what then happens in the schools. The other thing to note, especially around professional development, we saw cultural competency as just one of the professional development requirements that are increasing um, across schools. Um, and we know just thinking about um, being in a school, there's no, no way, at least in my opinion, that a, any given school district is going to provide professional development around 12 different uh, health related topics in addition to all the PD that has to be done around academics. And so it is really a question of are school districts actually implementing these requirements? I mean, it's really an open question that I think would be an excellent, uh, uh, excellent story for a journalist to pursue. Great. Great. And I know that um, you do have something about vaccines also in there, and this is probably too early to, to tell, but something for the future is whether or not um, states are going to require um, COVID vaccines for students to be in the classroom or if those same exemptions that they have also are a blanket over COVID. And I think that's going to be um, something that we can examine in the future. Absolutely. And I can actually paste in um, to the chat a link to uh, one of our partner organizations just released a, an updated brief looking at vaccination uh, policies and thinking about waivers. So many states right now still um, allow a personal exemption uh, for vaccina vaccines. And we know this came up um, just a couple of years ago in regards to measles outbreaks that were occurring um, in, in places where uh, vaccine waivers were allowed. Um, so this debate started even before uh, COVID vaccination became a topic of discussion. Um, so it is a very interesting topic and I'm happy to share that brief as well. Great. Lori, I think we're sending it back to you for questions um, from uh, folks who have joined. Hi folks, if you can uh, please uh, uh, submit questions, we'd greatly appreciate it. We have one right now from Paul Petula. Um, will the database have information about past policies in the states regarding the 200 topic um, uh, history of, of how legislative policies were enacted? Um, or is it simply a snapshot of how policies are in the present day? 
So it is a current snapshot. So it is linking to what policies are currently on the books. Um, but we do have the data for 2017 available. So if it's something that you are interested in using, feel free to reach out to us. We were happy to provide that for you. Um, from Stell Simonton of Youth Today, can I use this database to find out um, uh, school recess policies across the nation? Yes, you can. Um, we do have a code just for recess, um, and I could potentially show that. Um, I can pull that up if you give me just a few uh, moments and uh, pass the control. But yes, we do have research, resource policy, uh, recess policies, excuse me. Um, so uh, that category is under our physical education and activity domain, um, recess. We also have a um, specific category for recess before lunch because we know that resource before lunch, recess, I cannot speak today, I apologize. Recess before lunch is a very important thing, especially for elementary school students. So if we pull up recess here, um, we can see the, uh, the variety of uh, ways that states are uh, addressing this topic, um, those states that require daily recess uh, versus those that just recommend it. Um, and again, one thing that I didn't point out before is you can also download these maps. So you can download the map as an image or a PDF or even in a PowerPoint presentation, and that should allow you even to send it to your uh, graphic designers internally to use these data. These are all open source, so you are free to use it for your publications, um, and, and we encourage you to do so. Um, from Charlotte West, um, does the database track college and career counseling in addition to social and emotional counseling? Uh, yes, so that is captured in, uh, in our counseling uh, variables. Um, to some degree, you need to sort through them. Uh, we have a focus on mental health and as well as a focus on counseling at large. So if we go to those, um, those are in our counseling, psychological, and social service domain. Uh, we can see that we have um, school counseling at both the elementary and secondary level, as well as school-based and school-linked mental health services. Um, so I'll bring up school counseling at the elementary school level so we can see that. Um, and we can see at the secondary level, when you go through and look at the actual text of these domains, you can see how they talk about college and career counseling in regards to um, the requirements here. And you can see the vast majority of states do require uh, school counseling at the secondary level. And when is the database going live again? Um, so the, I, it was originally supposed to go live by today, but I understand it's been postponed. When, when is it going live? Yes, yeah, so it should be um, live within the next uh, week. Um, we are finalizing and making sure everything is easy to use and that there are no errors. Um, so, um, but the Tableau database is available if you want to just click through it. Um, I believe Lori has put that link in the chat. Um, and we will have the full database up. We will make sure to send that link uh, back to Lori so that you have it as well. And um, you can also see the old data, the 2017 data already on the statepolicies.nasb.org slash health, which will be the link um, for the new updated website as well. Yeah, this database also uh, focuses on things like uh, school food, um, free or reduced price lunch policies, uh, and um, cafeteria policies. It has things on, on physical education. It has things on school health, like clinics and um, and those kinds of things, I wonder if you can um, give us some citations in those categories as well um, for when people are returned um, to in-person schooling. Yeah, absolutely. So as, as you noted, Lori, that we cover everything from school, uh, school lunches to employee wellness. And I think employee wellness in particular is a really important issue that we are um, really having to grapple with right now um, in regards to COVID and how um, teachers are, teachers and other educators, I should say, are uh, having to take on a lot more burden. Um, and so, unfortunately, what we know about employee wellness is that very few states actually have policies on employee wellness. Um, what we see, for instance, if we look at uh, just staff wellness policies, we only see a very small handful 
of states cover this in codified law, and a few others cover it, that triangle, um, in non-codified policy. So this is an area where we expect a lot of growth over the next couple of years, especially as we're thinking about the response to COVID. Um, in terms of school nutrition, we cover everything from um, sodium requirements, uh, added sugar requirements. Um, we cover whether or not there needs to be free potable water during lunch, which is another very important issue. Um, these all, uh, all uh, make for a very important context in which school students are going back to school with COVID. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how much of this they actually still implement. For example, in physical education, many states are still requiring uh, what is the gold standard of, for instance, 225 minutes per week in a secondary school environment for physical education. But we know that that may be more difficult to do, especially in winter months. Uh, when uh, we have to consider social distancing. So all of these policies are technically still on the books. The schools are still expected to follow them, but the degree to which they can, um, especially as we come back from COVID, um, is something that I think would be really interesting to investigate. Okay, and somebody was asking about the um, a Tableau link. It's on the chat section. I tried to just enter it into the questions, but I'm having some not so much success on um, entering things into the, the question and answer section. Um, let's see if we have other questions. Does anybody else want to ask anything? Um, uh, any other comments, Melissa, um, about story ideas that occurred to you as, as Deb was presenting? Uh, the part about recess was really interesting to me because I've examined this before and even when there might be a recommendation instead of a mandate or, um, you know, from states, school districts on their own kind of act, um, well, they act on their own. And so there are a lot of times where they'll take away recess from students because they're trading in that time to study for a state mandated exam or as punishment. And so unless there are policies specifically in place addressing those things at the state level, school districts often on their own, um, you know, take it as a recommendation that they don't have to give um, students that physical education. But I think um, Deborah's right that everything's gonna be changing as all students return or most students return back to the classroom uh, in coming months or next year. And um, they were just, it, it'll be trickier to get that time in place. Yeah, and I, I would also stress sort of based on what you were talking about, we also have a whole host of policies that we've categorized around school discipline, including uh, thinking about ways that uh, schools are restricting, or states are restricting schools and their ability, for instance, to take away recess as a punishment, um, but also largely focused on suspension and expulsion and our um, efforts to move away from exclusionary discipline. So we have, um, both uh, those limits on exclusionary discipline as well as states' efforts to include a focus on equity in school discipline. So many states, for instance, are um, requiring schools to actually track um, by racial demographics how many suspensions, expulsions, et cetera, are occurring in their school buildings. Um, and it doesn't have policies, also uh, list the policies on how many, uh, whether uh, schools have school resource officers um, yes. Yes. So we have a couple of different school resource officer policies that we include, um, including the requirements for training. So we know that when school resource officers have more of a background in child development and um, have a better understanding of sort of the normal, typical behaviors that uh, children and adolescents engage in, they are much less likely to overreact, um, as well as requirements around MOUs between school districts and um, law enforcement um, in terms of the role that school resource officers can and cannot play at school, whether or not school resource officers have a role in ordinary school discipline versus uh, criminal offenses for which they are there to protect against. And if I can interject, um, Deborah, does that data include, um, does it show like which states require uh, mental health training for those officers? Yes, it does. Um, so I can try to pull that up here, but yes, um, 
here is the school resource officer training, um, and this is very specific to thinking about um, training on child development issues, so mental health um, and other things. So you'll see, for instance, um, New Jersey, Connecticut, uh, Rhode Island, New York, all require some sort of formalized training for school resource officers that is in addition to any law enforcement training that those officers have. Great. Well, um, if it, no one else has any other questions, I think we are, uh, our express webinar is coming to a close. Um, I wanna thank our um, presenter and our moderator, um, Deborah and Melissa for um, participating in this express webinar. I think there is a treasure trove of story ideas that'll come out of this uh, very valuable database. Um, so um, thank you again, and I wanna thank you for attending the conference, folks. And as soon as the webinar uh, closes, you'll see an evaluation survey. Please complete it. Your feedback is important and it helps us to improve. And finally, uh, visit ewa.org slash events to sign up for upcoming online and in, -per well, one of these days, in-person webinars, seminars. Thanks and have a great day, everyone.